Welcome back. Today I thought we'd talk about I, I'm an idiot. That's what this video is about, me being an idiot. I'm wearing my red sweatshirt of shame. In some small part, maybe this is a public service announcement. It might help three, perhaps four people out there. But mostly, it's a story about not seeing the forest for the trees. I think this will be quick. I don't have a ton to say. And since I've run out of space in the garage, I'm filming this in my dining room. My wife could come home at any minute. But let me start at the beginning. This bike is a Sherco 2.9 or 290, depending who you talk to. That's only of passing importance. But since the day I got it, this has suffered from a soft and spongy rear brake. On a motorcycle, usually your right foot is the rear brake. Stops the back tire. The front will brake so fast and so hard your glasses and dentures fly out cartoon style. But the back, soft and spongy. I believe soft and spongy are probably self-explanatory, but for anyone that might not know what that means, the rear brake worked, but pushing on the brake pedal wasn't the breathtaking, mind-blowing, life-altering experience it should have been. The pedal would feel soft and, well, spongy. It would sink almost down to the skid plate before slowing the bike down. After much heartache, I've since fixed it. It's working great now. This is a lessons learned video, but it was soft and spongy. For the gearheads out there, yes, classic sign of air in the brake line or a leak perhaps. Great work, gold star, but it wasn't that. When I got my hands on this bike, I did the usual, I just bought something maintenance. Cleaned it, replaced the air filter, spark plug, checked all the bolts were tightened to the brink of snapping, changed the fluids, and put in new brake pads and fresh brake fluid. All that stuff might have been perfectly fine when I bought it, but in good conscience, and because I have trust issues, I did the usual maintenance. Again, new pads, fresh oil, and purged all the air out of the line. The rear brake was better, but in a day or two, again, soft and spongy. I rode like that for a while. You do get used to it, I suppose. I mean, the bike did stop, eventually, until it started bugging me again. I'd take a ride on someone else's bike, see how snappy the rear brake was, and I'd dig back in to try to fix it. I mean, there's not that many parts. What could it be? There must have still been some air in there somewhere. Bled the brake lines yet again. Still soft and spongy. That went on for way longer than it should have. I couldn't figure it out. I'd lose sleep over it, stop eating, my relationships were in shambles, and every time I'd get near this bike, I could swear it was taunting me. Never more. Something you should know, a little background. Shurkos, as it turns out, have a bit of a reputation for soft rear brakes. Older Shurkos, from what I'm told anyway. Though I've ridden plenty of other Shurkos with good rear brakes. That, and they're notoriously difficult to bleed. Probably because the brake line roller coasters through the whole bike, so there's plenty of spots for air to get stuck. Consequently, anyone I'd talk to about my debilitating problem, other Shurko owners, mechanics, trials enthusiasts, online forums, the person at the supermarket checkout, would all insist on the need for proper bleeding. Now, just so we're clear here, I know how to bleed brakes. In this town, anyone has spongy brakes they can't figure out, I'm the guy they come to. I've been bleeding brakes since I was three. I drink a quart of brake fluid a day. I have more than one mid-60s cartoon-style tattoo consisting of a clever play on words about brake bleeding, one of which may or may not have been acquired in rear brakes prison using cigarette ash and a rusty spoon. So I want you to know exactly who you're talking to here, Skylar. I am the one who bleeds. That last one might not have come out. I've put 10 quarts, figuratively, of perfectly good brake fluid through that rear brake trying to get out that one fugitive air bubble that would solve all my problems. I've bled it forward, backwards, with a syringe, without a syringe. I strung this bike up like a hog from its rear wheel, its front wheel. I bled it at the banjo bolts. I got so desperate at one point I even broke down and bought one of those stupid bleed pumps. I'm talking about these things, 25, maybe 30 bucks on eBay. I mean, maybe they're cool if you're doing other vacuum tests or pressure tests. Maybe you work on small carburetors or something, I don't know. On stubborn brakes, I've always used just a cheap 20 or 30 cent syringe. Volume maybe isn't that much different. Maybe 50% more on the vacuum pump, I don't know. 
Maybe they're all right. I might just be bitter because I spent 30 bucks and air in the line wasn't my problem. What do you say we pick this up again tomorrow? Let's talk about hydraulic brakes a minute. Bike, car, truck, milling machine, helicopter, skateboard, doesn't matter. They're all more or less the same. Some contraption, a lever or a pedal, gives you a mechanical advantage and pushes a piston in a master cylinder. Unfortunately, I can't show you the master cylinder here because on this bike, it's hidden behind the frame. These are the two bolts that hold it in place. Actually, I present to you the rear brake master cylinder. And fun fact, you get in the same amount of trouble for having two bikes in the dining room as one, so you might as well. This is a Beta 125 and it has the master cylinder easily Betas have got to be up there as one of the probably best engineered bikes on the market. That said, I've never really been a fan. I don't know what it is about them, just not for me. One thing I will give them though, they really wear their hearts on their sleeve. Pretty much all of the important clockwork is readily accessible. Case in point, the master cylinder. Same thing with the engine coolant. I can get to it without having to break down 75% of the bike. But anyway, the master cylinder. Here is our lever, our control. This again gives us some mechanical advantage. In this case, maybe two or three to one. And when you push the pedal, it in turn pushes on oil in the master cylinder. Let's see if I can do this. The master cylinder is basically like a syringe full of oil. And when you push on the lever, it pushes on the oil. There are seals in there just like there are inside of a syringe. That brake fluid that you pressurized, in this case with your foot, is carried via the brake line to your rear caliper. This is your caliper. Well, it's my caliper, but I'm a friendly kind of guy. Calipers, put simply, are just two or more little hydraulic pistons being driven by the pressure that you generated like, you know, regular hydraulic pistons. That pressure extends those pistons squeezes them onto a rotor and stops the wheel, like a hydraulic C-clamp. You remember the Iron Sheik did that iron claw thing to people's faces? No, oh, wait, that was the camel clutch. Sorry, wrong video. Almost forgot about the brake pads. Because calipers kept heating up and wearing out, they invented brake pads, like these. Aren't these the cutest little? These go between your caliper pistons and the rotor and do the actual braking. The caliper squeezes on these and not your rotor. There's a fancy friction material in these that wear out in time. You can replace just the pads instead of the whole caliper. Pretty clever, huh? When you hit your brakes, if your car is squealing like Hulk Hogan in a camel clutch, it's probably worn out brake pads. So, spongy brakes. Given what we know now, let's try to figure out what could cause that. First things first, if you have no oil in your lines, your brakes won't work. Oil is important. That's the whole premise behind the bad guys in 80s TV shows always cutting people's brake lines which is super out of fashion these days and probably very illegal, so don't do that. Except in exceedingly rare circumstances, cutting brake lines stopped being funny about 30 years ago. Second, of course, if your pads are worn out, well, you might have guessed it, your brakes won't work or they won't work very well. If you got oil in the system and your pads are good, we finally get to the usual suspect, trapped air. Let's hope this isn't your real brake system, but for a moment, let's imagine that it is. You have a master cylinder on one end that you're pushing on and a caliper on the other. That'd have a brake pad on the end and pushes up against your rotor. Technically, there'd be two or more of these facing each other, squeezing the rotor. But come on, what do I look like, Bill Nye? If I pressurize the master cylinder by stomping on a pedal or pulling the lever, that pressure is telegraphed to the caliper via the brake line and the brake pads move. With any luck, that results in your vehicle slowing down and stopping. Now this system is completely full. In this case, that's melted blue raspberry popsicle. But in yours, it might be brake fluid. Absolutely no air in the system. Let's introduce a bit of air and see what happens. This might happen when you change your brake fluid or get low on fluid. Maybe you're doing work on your brakes. There's a million reasons air can get into the line. Now, when I apply the brakes, instead of all the pressure in the line going to the caliper, we lose a lot of that energy compressing the air bubble. See that bubble getting smaller? That springy, spongy bubble is robbing us of braking power. If you're bleeding your brakes using the old pump the pedal and burp the bleeder screw routine, which admittedly works 99% of the time, probably because the air is likely near your caliper, but if you're using just the brake pedal, 
you've got fresh oil in the reservoir and you're pumping it through your system, old oil is coming out the back, but because you can't move enough of it fast enough, the air bubbles are just dancing around in there. Now here we have the benefit of seeing it, but in your brake system, you'll have no idea where it's at. But say we're trying to get it out. If we push oil through the line, we can get the bubble to move, but if it's in a high spot, like it is here, when we stop moving oil, it'll just move back to where it was. A bubble like that is what I thought I was up against. Again, the brake line routing on that bike is maybe a little crazy. There's a lot of high spots for a little bubble like that to get trapped in. Now you can try hanging your car or your bike from the rafters so your brake lines are more conducive to letting the bubble roll out, but hanging a car or motorcycle from your ceiling can be a lot of work. That's where maybe a syringe or a bleed pump can come in handy. It can move a lot more oil faster than the pedal pumping thing, and it'll drive or suck all those bubbles out. After all that brake bleeding, after burning through my retirement fund and kids' inheritance on brake fluid, I convinced myself it wasn't trapped there. So now, the other suspect for soft brakes is a leak, an oil leak. I hit the brakes, the oil is pressurized, but I'm losing that pressure to a leak. Now, I had considered that, but the thing about leaks, though, is you usually see them. You'll find a mess somewhere on the bike or on the floor, but both the bike and the floor were dry as a bone, and the oil level stayed constant. I wasn't losing oil, I was losing pressure. I packed my bags and retreated into the hills for three, maybe four moons when one exceptionally dark, cold, and hungry night, it hit me. I had an aha moment. I put out my fire, got dressed, and rushed straight home. Maybe, just maybe, I had a bad seal in the master cylinder. In fact, I was 100% sure for the second time I'd found the problem. Also, I don't know why I have you all down here on the floor. Let's head back to the bench. I bought a master cylinder rebuild kit, and these are the parts I replaced. This is just a dust boot, a dust seal, and that's the piston. The actual brake lever you hit with your foot pushes on the bottom here. There's a little divot that a pin sits into, and the brake oil is up in here around this spring. When this is compressed, that seal pushes that oil, builds the pressure, and lets the calipers do their thing. A worn or damaged seal inside the master cylinder could let oil slip past it losing pressure without a visible leak. Meaning as it's pressurizing oil above it, you would just get some blowback past the seal, but not come out of the system. It'd just get pushed up into the reservoir, I guess. That seal does the same job that this big seal does in the syringe. Sure, my wife and kids left me, but that's okay, because I was a genius. Bad master cylinder seal. Anyway, long story short, I rebuilt the rear master cylinder and my brake was still soft and spongy. This story has gotten to be 15 minutes longer than it should have been, so let's bring it home. Twice a week during marriage counseling, my mind got to wandering, and it settled on the brake line itself. It's not unheard of for brake lines to go bad, and for the third time, I was 100% sure I'd found the problem. In my 305 years on this earth, I personally have only ever seen that happen once, a brake line go bad, and that was in a car. Though a bad line in a car usually results in a locked up caliper. Your brakes might start to drag. The pressurized oil can get in, but it can't easily back out. There's a lot of pressure in these lines, and if they go bad, they can go soft and mushy, or develop a weak spot. And when you brake, the pressure sort of inflates them like a balloon. Instead of heading back to your caliper and stopping you from hitting that tree, the brake line itself robs you of that stopping power. If you can't tell by the fact that I'm holding a perfectly good brake line and I'm still talking that the problem wasn't this, well, it wasn't this. All right, let me try to cut to the chase and just tell you what happened. It was two weeks ago, I guess, at this point. I'm in the shower, getting ready to face the day, trying to keep the shampoo out of my morning coffee when it finally dawned on me. I towelled off, grabbed the rest of my shampoo coffee, ran out of the house and down into the garage, sat down at the bike, took a deep breath, and measured my rear freaking rotor. 83,000, 2.1 millimeters. I ran to check the spec and wouldn't you know it, three millimeters, 118,000. This stupid rotor was worn. This is a new one. This is just a dramatic reenactment. I'd show you the old one had I not melted it with my mind in a fit of pure unadulterated rage. But the old rotor looked perfect, exactly like this one. Usually you can see and hear a bad rotor from a mile away. In all my asking and digging around, in all my searching, prodding, and poking, not a single person so much as even said the word rotor. And I've since disavowed all my friends. See, and this is going to get technical now. It took me a minute to wrap my head around it. As you use things, they wear out. 
Again, usually you can see worn out rotors a mile away. They'd have grooves or steps worn into them. A low area where the pads have been working, but oh no, not mine. Mine was new as a baby's bottom. I wonder now if the previous owner didn't do something stupid like have it resurfaced. I mean, frankly, that's probably what I... Calipers are designed for only so much squeeze, only so much travel. Just like with C-clamps, you can squeeze all you want, but if the screw doesn't reach, it's all for naught. If there's no rotor there for the oil pressure and calipers to squeeze onto, they're just hanging out in space. That's why my brake pedal was coming down so low. I must have been running out of travel in the master cylinder before I reached out the worn out rotor. Brake pedal felt firm at the bottom, but I wasn't stopping. So it felt like pressure loss when in fact it was just me being an idiot. 50 bucks and one marriage later and there it is, a new rotor. The bike now stops on a dime. Sure, it throws me over the handlebars every time I do that, but if I see a dime and I want to stop on it, I can. And really, isn't that the whole point of all of this? There you have it. I was an idiot and paid the price, financially and emotionally. Let's hope this video serves to keep that from happening to you or someone you love. Hope you liked it, and as always, check your rotors.